It's time for us to begin our worship together. We want to greet our guests and welcome you to the services here at College Hill. I know we've got some family members visiting the family here, and we're glad to see you. We've got some folks that just moved in the area visiting today, and we're thankful that we get to spend some time with them. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this occasion that we can be together and to worship you and exalt your name and song and spend time in your word. Pray, Father, you'd be with Stephen and those that will be reading from Scripture today as we focus on Christ. As we focus upon gathering around the Lord's table, that we remember the great sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf, doing what we could not do for ourselves in reconciling us with you. Pray that you'd bless our worship today and help us to focus on singing praises unto you and upon the hearing of your word, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as jesus died the wrath of god was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of christ i live there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands for victory since curse has lost its grip on me for i am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of christ no guilt in life no fear in death this is the power of christ in me from life's first cry to final breath jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man 
can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns and calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand good morning it's good to be with you this morning for by the tender mercy of our God, Luke says, the dawn from on high will break upon us, give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our peace in the way of peace. Let's pray together. Dear Father, Lord, we love you so much. And as we approach your throne today in worship, we ask that you would guide our hearts and our minds to consider the cross of Christ, the, the price that he paid for our lives, Lord, and, and, and the hope that he gives us of a life eternal with you. Lord, bless us today as we read from your word. Help us to live lives that would be worthy of the calling that you have given us. It's in Christ's holy name that I pray. Amen. This morning we have gathered together here to hear the story of our faith. I want to tell you about a tradition that some friends and Alyssa and I have at Harding, and we have a Bible study that we go to at Harding. And what we do once a year with this Bible study has sort of inspired our approach to worship today. Um, it's a Tuesday night Bible study, and it's a, a student-led group, and it's kind of the closest group of friends we have at Harding. And once we were at Bible study, we got to talking with some of our friends, and one of them said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could sit down together and read the story of our faith, I mean, the whole thing from start to finish, just take an evening and, and read through as much of this story that we hold so dearly as we can. I don't think he was really thinking about it when he said it. He just kind of threw it out there, but, but then it was out there, and we all sort of started to think about it, and we, we said, why not? And so we decided to try it, and some people said, we'll take and we'll pick the passages that we read because we won't have time to read all of it. And one girl, Claire, who had a house in Circe, said, you can come to my house. Well, we can use our upstairs game room. And so this idea that was sort of kind of just tossed out there um, started to take shape, and we, we started to decide, we're really going to do this. And so we did. We set a date, and on a Saturday night in October... A group of about 20 college students gathered to get together in the upper room of Claire Summers' house. And we, from about 6 p.m. to midnight, we read aloud, starting in Genesis, from the story of our faith. And we've been working all summer here at College Hill to go through this gospel of Luke, and we were getting pretty close to the finish line now. We, we heard the story of how Jesus entered Jerusalem, riding in on the colt of a donkey. And today, we have reached the crux, the, the turning point in this great gospel. And what I'd like to do today is to invite you, like the, the friends that we have at school, to gather together in the upper room and to just hear the story that has inspired our faith, to, to huddle together here like a band of believers and, and to tell it again, the story of God's love in the place where God's love is most evident, in the story of the cross. And so over the course of our worship today and the songs that we sing and the scriptures that we read, we will hear the story of our salvation told again. We won't start in Genesis, we'll start here in Genesis chapter 22, and I'd invite you to do whatever you need to do to join us in the upper room and to hear this story as if you were hearing it for the first time. So we begin Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 1. Now the festival of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was near, and the chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to put Jesus to death, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, who was one of the twelve. And Judas went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers of the temple police about how he might betray Jesus to them. And they were greatly pleased and agreed to give him money. So he consented. 
and began to look for an opportunity to betray Jesus to them when no crowd was present. Then came the day of the unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover meal for us that we may eat it. And they asked him, Lord, where do you want us to make preparations for it? Listen, he said to them, when you've entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room already furnished. Today we follow in the footsteps of those disciples to the upper room. And Jesus said, make your preparations for us there. Are you listening? I hope everybody heard what Stephen said just now. And this, this lesson that you hear today is probably going to be the most important one that you'll hear this year. Because it is talking about our Lord and Savior and, and the gospel that, that we, we uh, have so much hope in. And uh, it, Stephen also prepared around this that the songs that we sing today are going to be focused on this same topic. And, uh, and so just... While, while we sing, while we worship, while we pray, while we listen to Stephen speak, let's listen. Let's listen to God. <clears throat> How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory As we prepare to eat the bread, we're going to read Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 23. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you I will not drink it again, drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. And they began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time when we can come together and remember your son's death on the cross. What an incredible act of love and sacrifice that he demonstrated for us and gives us an opportunity for salvation with you because of that love. As we eat this bread, help us remember his body which was broken on the cross and the agony that he suffered on our account of our sins. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
We're going to continue reading in chapter 22. We'll be, read verses 31 through 34 and then 39 through 46. Jesus is talking to Peter says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and we have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three, deny three times that you know me. Jesus went as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Let's pray again. Dearly Father, it's hard to imagine as parents us being willing to give up our children for anything that you gave up your son for us when we were completely unworthy of that kind of love and sacrifice, but we praise and thank you for that. As we drink this cup, help us remember Jesus' blood, which he shed on the cross. Help us not to just think about that today, but each and every day that we live as Christians and remember that um, Jesus did something for us that we were totally unworthy of. But we do thank you so much for that. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Behold a man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is 
is finished. We just finished what should be the best part of our week, but what we're about to do should be right behind it. Because really, there's not much anything better in life than feeling like you're a part of something, that you make a difference. When we give money back to God, God really didn't need us. He could have accomplished whatever he wants to in this world without our help. But what a joy and a blessing it is that we get to be a part of that and help with it. And so as we get prepared to give back part of what we have to God, which is his anyway, let's remember what a joy this should be for all of us. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the blessings you give to us. You have given us so much more than we need or deserve, and we just praise and thank you that you have blessed us so richly. Help us with joy each week to be prepared to participate with you in the work that you have to do. We thank you so much that you've included us in that. Help us to remember that um, we have an obligation to look out to our community and throughout the world and help people wherever we possibly can. And we thank you that we have a chance to do that. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. While Jesus was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. And he approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, is it with a kiss that you are betraying the Son of Man? When those who were around him saw what was coming, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the, slaves, the slave of the high priest's ear and cut it off. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear, and he healed him. And Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple police, and to the elders who had come for him, Have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him in the firelight, stared at him and said, This man also was with him. But Peter denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. A little later, someone else on seeing him said, You are also one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then about an hour later, still another kept insisting, Surely this man was also with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, I do not know what you're talking about. And at that moment, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. Peter went out and he wept bitterly. We'll be singing three verses of 10,000 Angels. Uh, we will not be singing the chorus this morning. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
They bound the hand of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the streets in shame. They spat upon the Savior so pure and free from sin. They said, crucify him, he's to blame. Upon his precious head they placed a crown of thorns. They laughed and said, Behold the King. They struck him and they cursed him and mocked his holy name. All alone he suffered everything. To the howling mob he yielded, he did not for mercy cry. The cross of shame he took alone. And when he cried, it's finished, he gave himself to die. Salvation's wondrous plan was done. The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, Prophesy, who, is, who hit you? And they said many other insulting things. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. If you are the Messiah, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, If I tell you, you will not believe me, and if I ask you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated on the right hand of the mighty God. And they all asked, Are you the Son of God? He replied, You say that I am. Then they said, Why do we need any more testimony? We have heard this all from his own lips. Let's all stand for this song before the lesson this morning. <clears throat> Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior, bearing shame and scoffing rude. In my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior, guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless lamb. Of God was he, full atonement can it be, hallelujah, what a Savior. Please be seated. Well, it's Friday in Jerusalem. We've gathered here this morning to hear the story of Jesus on the cross because in some way we believe that it is our story. When Alyssa and I got together with our friends in Circe to read the story of our faith, we didn't do it because it was a story that we liked a lot, although it is a beautiful story. But it's more than that. We read the story of Jesus because we believe that somehow it is our own story. Story That when we tell the story of Jesus on the cross, we are telling some part of our own lives. 
That, that somewhere in the gap between Friday in Jerusalem and, and Sunday at the empty tomb lies our lives, that, that we're living somewhere in the space in between. I think about Christians in Asia who gather under their thatched roof huts and their cloak of darkness to hear the story again because they believe that the story is their story. And so they risk their lives to hear it. I think about Christians in Ukraine, where we support Christians, and many of you have met some or have seen their faces in photographs, and, and, and their churches are ransacked as their neighborhoods are destroyed by fighting and violence and darkness. And I think about those Christians gathering in the upper rooms of a house, in a huddle, talking softly, telling the story again, because it is their story. They believe that their lives span the gap between Friday and Sunday. It's Friday in Jerusalem. I believe that it is Friday in our world today, our world where passenger planes are shot out of the sky for no reason. What for? Our world where children are kidnapped and held hostage, where eight-year-olds are given machine guns and told to kill their brothers. Our world where Central American orphans are stacked onto buses and, and screamed out of town. You're not welcome here. It's Friday in our world. When we gathered at Claire's house to read this story, at every hour we would stop and we would allow someone in our group to take five minutes and tell their story of faith, how they came to know Jesus. Some of the stories were about parents who had divorced when they were young. Some of the stories were about alcohol or substance abuse. Some of them were about a sibling with cancer or about a parent who had gotten so sick that they almost died. And we see the world around us. We see tragedy and struggle. We see violence and brokenness and hurt. And we can't help but think that it is Friday in our world. But we cling to this story because we believe that somehow it is our own, and that by the sheer momentum of God's mercy for us, we too might be carried from this dark Friday in Jerusalem to the dawn of morning, Sunday morning. For by the tender mercy of God, who says, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet the way of peace. This is our story. Then the assembly rose as a body and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man perverting our nation, forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor, and saying that he is the Messiah, a king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, You say so. And Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for an accusation against this man. But they were insistent. And they said, He stirs up the people by teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee where he began, and even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he was and that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him off to Herod, who himself was already in Jerusalem at the time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad. For he had been wanting to see him for a long time because he had heard about it and was hoping to see him perform a sign. So he questioned Jesus at some length. But Jesus gave him no answer. And the chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. And even Herod and his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. They put an elegant robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. That same day, Herod and Pilate became friends with one another before this day had been enemies. Pilate then called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was perverting the people, and here I have examined him in your presence, and I have not found any reason for guilt for the charges that you've given him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. Indeed, he has done nothing deserving death. I will therefore have him flogged and release him. But then they all shouted out together, Away with this fellow. Release Barabbas for us. 
Barabbas was a man who had been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. And Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify! A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no ground for the sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged and release him. But they kept urgently demanding with loud shouts that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave his verdict that their demand should be granted. He released the man that they had asked for, the one who had been put in prison for insurrection and murder. And he handed Jesus over as they wished. As they led him away, they seized the man, Simon, the Cyrene, who was coming from the country, and they laid the cross on him. And they made him carry it behind Jesus. A great number of the people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. They will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching them. The leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. But there was an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who was hanging there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we're getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me. About noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon when the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God said, certainly this man was innocent. When all the crowds who had gathered there for the spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all of his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood in distance, watching these things. It's Friday in Jerusalem. Is it Friday in your world? Do you wear the pain of a broken life on your shoulders? Do you feel the violence of a broken world in your chest? Will you say to your world, as Jesus has said to his own, Father, forgive them, and they know not what they do. Will you say to your Father, as Jesus has said to his own, into your hands I commit my spirit. Will you respond to the brokenness and violence of our world as Jesus has responded, not with a sword, but with a cross, not with a battle cry, but with a final breath? Didn't know what to expect when on a Saturday night in October, gathered with a group of friends to 
read this story together. I didn't know what it would be like. Would we be bored? Could we really stand to read for six hours straight without stopping? Didn't know what would happen. But when we got to this part in the story, looked up at the faces in the circle around me, I could see tears in the eyes of many of my closest friends. They were strange tears. It's strange to sit and cry together at the reading of a words from a book, at, the, at hearing a story that we've heard so often told. There were strange tears of sorrow at the disgrace of the cross. There were tears laced with joy. The sun would set on this day of sorrow, and that the dawn of morning was coming soon. We were there at Claire's house, and it was getting close to midnight. And as the day passed from night to morning, and Saturday night ended, and Sunday began, we read these words together. There was a good and righteous man named Joseph, who, though a member of the council, had not agreed to their plan of action. And he came from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, and he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it on a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how the body was laid. Then they returned home and prepared spices and ointments for his body, and on the Sabbath day, they rested according to the commandments. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find his body. And while they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling white clothes stood beside them. And the women were terrified and bowed their heads to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you seek the living with the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all of this to the eleven and all the rest. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women who went there and told the apostles. But these words seemed to them like an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and he ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by, him, by themselves, and then he went home amazed what had happened. This is the story of our faith. The story that for centuries has united and inspired people like us to believe that even on this broken world, where darkness and sin stain the earth like shadows, even on our broken hearts, where sin has stained our souls with darkness, on these dark places, by the tender mercy of God, a great light has shined. The dawning of the morning to come. That we might be led by Him in the way of peace. This is the story of our faith. The story that a man named Jesus, although He was the Son of God, chose to be a human like us. To live a life like we live. To die a life Die a death like we will one day die, but death could not contain this Jesus. <coughs> As the sun rose on Sunday morning, the tomb that held his body was empty. And the angel said, Why do you seek the living with the dead? He is not here. Peter's holding the strips of white linen to his chest in disbelief. He is not here. You can look here, but you won't find him. He's alive. He's risen. This is the story of our faith. The story of you, is it not? 
And if you accept the faith in Jesus, if you, if you choose for yourself a new kind of life, the kind of life that starts at the first five of the morning, on Sunday morning, if you would choose to die to yourself as Jesus died, if you would say to the world that hurts you, Father, forgive them as Jesus did, if you would choose to follow in his footsteps, then the story is your story. From the day of Christ's coming, when he returns to snap open the locks and to, and to pull back the gates and to proclaim to the captives you are free, they may look for you in darkness, but they will not find you there. And a voice from heaven will say, He is not here. You can look, but you won't find Him. He's alive. He is risen. Will you claim the story as your story today? Will you be baptized? Will you cross the threshold from Friday to Sunday, from this old life of sin and brokenness to a new life everlasting. It had to be Peter who denied Jesus on Friday, but who held the strips of linen in his hands on Sunday. It had to be Peter when the crowd is gathered in Jerusalem and they're cut to the heart and, and Peter says, repent and be baptized, all of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. It had to be him. Because he was the one who denied Jesus the most. But he chose to leave that life where he denied Jesus behind and take hold of the story of Jesus and claim it as his own. Take hold of the death of Jesus and the new life of Jesus and make it his identity. This is the story of our faith. But only if you claim it as your own. We'll sing the song as an invitation. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Will you claim the story as your own today? Will you come? Well, together we stand and sing. No power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His Not give an answer, but this I know with all my heart his wounds have paid my ransom, but this. Thank you, Stephen. We've been focused on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ today. Stephen has pointed us to that throughout the summer. We appreciate the messages he's brought to us and the focus that he's kept us on. I want to say again to our visitors and our guests today, we welcome you and we hope that you'll be able to stay around just a little bit. Let us greet you. Today we're honoring uh, Mark and Andrew. Actually, we're shipping them south. 
they're relocating to the San Antonio area and we want to say uh, goodbye and greet them uh, uh, with a meal following our service this morning. So uh, we'll be doing that in just a little while. Eileen Reed has been admitted to HEB. She's in room 263, suffering from uh, uh, several things. I think uh, sodium level is low and her blood pressure is not where it ought to be and a few other things. So she's undergoing tests. I understand she's perhaps feeling a little bit better. They've been giving her some sodium uh, intravenously and uh, that's helped a lot. There's quite a number of folks that are in our news today. If you picked up the handout, we have f three families that are uh, grieving the loss of loved ones. Uh, Lisa Cox, her aunt. Uh, Rhonda Harvey's aunt also, and uh, Robert Jones's stepmother who has passed away and we want to remember these families. Perhaps you uh, caught the news, I guess it was on last evening's news, of the uh, doctor in Liberia who is being there, who is there to help with the uh, outbreak of 